Did you know that shark attacks save lives? And that hot tap water is more dangerous than terrorism? I know, you think I'm out of my mind. This guy has lost the plot. I promise that I have not lost the plot. And, and I haven't said hello properly again. This seems like a tradition now, but I promise that next time I'll do a proper intro. So let's start over again. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Power of Reason. This is the second episode of this late night series, which I'm running from here, my desk in London. So if you have missed the first episode, I advise you watch that one before this. So last time I distinguished between our intuitive and our rational way of thinking and I discussed how thinking by representativeness can lead us to contradict logic in some cases. Today we will talk about the availability heuristic, which is another shortcut our intuitive mind uses to answer questions and to make judgments and which influences greatly our perceptions of the world and also our fears, sometimes against reason. When I sit here at my desk, I ask myself many questions, but today I want to ask you one random question. Are there more words beginning with the letter K or words with the letter K in the third position? So think a few seconds. Mm-hmm. And now, give me your immediate answer. I can probably guess your answer, actually. And this is because in our mind, we recall words by their first letter. So it is easier to think of words beginning with the letter K. And so we are inclined to think that these are more numerous. However, there are actually twice as many words with the letter K in the third position than words beginning with the letter K. But we cannot easily retrieve from memory examples of words with the letter K in third position. So we think of them as less frequent or less likely. And in fact, if you can't still think of words with the letter K in the third position, let me try to convince you. So examples, ask, like, make, take, fake, duke, Awkward joke, right, I think is enough. <laughs> you just experienced with this thought experiment, the availability heuristic. So the availability heuristic is a shortcut that our mind uses to tell us the likelihood of something. If something comes easily to mind, if it is more available to our mind, then we intuitively expect it to be more likely. This is generally useful because if we experience something frequently, then we can expect it to happen again and be prepared. This is why we evolved this intuition. A trivial example. I live in London, so I experience rain often. And so I can easily think of rain. And correctly, I will expect rain to be more likely. This is a simple mechanism, very simple. However, Frequency is not the only thing that will make something come easily to mind. Extreme events, dramatic events, these are more quickly recalled than ordinary or positive ones. Similarly, personal experience is more available in memory than hearsay, pictures more than words, and vivid examples more than numbers or statistics. If you see a car upside down and on fire in person, that will make you more scared of driving than simply hearing a statistic such as driving kills 120 people per day in the US, which is true, by the way. So a vivid image can change our behavior more than hearing just a number. The problem with the availability heuristic is that when we are ha when we are asked about 
the frequency of something, we actually do not report the frequency, but we report the ease with which you can think of the examples of that specific class. Our mind evolved in a very different environment from what we have now. In the modern world, our perceptions are easily distorted, mainly by the media, of course. <laughs> The news reports only the extraordinary and the negative, and so we think that violence, disasters, and things like that are way more likely than they actually are, because we see them a lot on the news. So, let's look at how the mainstream media determine our fears. We will have to consider a time before the current pandemic, for which is a bit too early now to have sufficient data, to make a complete analysis. It would definitely be an interesting analysis and I'm sure I'll make a video about it as well, but a bit later on. So for now, let's look at the study from before, from a few years ago, which is still relevant to our understanding in this specific instance. In this study, it was shown that counting how many times mainstream e mainstream media in the US mention causes of death, terrorism alone made up 33% of the mentions, which is a third of the total. Now, that is a huge overrepresentation of terrorism because terrorism in the US only causes 0.01% of deaths. So on average, about 50 per year. Now, there are people, there are more people dying, struck by a lightning or drowning in their bathtub, stung by bees or wasps, or even dying by contact with hot tap water, which I don't even know how you do that. So even though terrorism is a very small threat, it creates mass panic because, well, because that's is precisely what it, terrorism is designed to do. It is designed for theater. Modern terrorism is possible only because of the reach that it gets through the mass media. Without the media, terrorism would be a highly ineffective military strategy, if you think about it, because it causes comparatively little damage and in fact it does not disable the enemy's ability to retaliate. Right. So terrorists are generally just mentally unstable people who are trying to get a guaranteed mass attention by killing innocent people. This is how most mass shootings happen, unfortunately. So a similar analysis of media overrepresenting a cause of death goes, of course, to homicide, which in the same study, which is before the current pandemic, got 23% of the mentions among the causes of death in the US media. But homicide actually represents only 0.7% of actual deaths. There are actually twice as many people dying every year because of a fall. But of course, a story of somebody falling down and dying is not nearly as compelling or interesting as a murder story because, well, it is not malevolent and of course it does not get the news channel good ratings. And so, for this reason, it is never reported. The result is that we don't really feel that death by falling is very frequent, but we are, on the other hand, very afraid of murderers. The availability bias brings about other misconceptions relative to fear. But let me give you some examples. Did you know that being a garbage collector, being a farmer, or even a gardener are statistically more dangerous than being a police officer or a firefighter? Surprising, right? And in fact, the two most dangerous jobs in the US are the fisherman and the logger. And you know why this is surprising? Because we can easily imagine police shootouts 
or we can easily imagine fires and brave firefighters. But we have never seen a movie about a bravely dying fisherman. And so we think that the probability of death for a police officer or a firefighter are much higher than what they actually are. This is uh, quite morbid, this whole list of causes of death. But I'm, I'm mentioning it because the availability heuristic really has an effect on our fears. A very classic example, another example of the availability bias is the fact that people are more scared of flying than of driving. When we all know by now that flying is the safest means of transport. But of course, a plane crash is a lot more dramatic than a car crash in our imagination and so it's more available in our mind. In a similar way, actually, even though we're not generally too afraid of, dri of driving a car, we still think that motor, motor vehicle accidents are fairly frequent. We hear about it in the local news. But actually, there are more people dying of pneumonia, more people dying of suicide or drug overdose than in a car crash. They're just not talked about as much. So we don't think about it as much. Let's look at other classic examples of irrational fears. Sharks. We are all scared of sharks. But if you're at the beach, you're statistically more likely to die hit by a falling coconut than eaten by a shark. <laughs> and the coconut the coconuts are ruthless and they're unpredictable because they act completely unprovoked, right? So, sharks only kill five people per year on average, worldwide. And of course, I feel really bad for those five people. But compare that to hippos. Hippos kill 500 people per year on average. Dogs, dogs kill 13,000 per year. And of course, let's not forget the deadliest animal of all. Who knows which one it is? The mosquito. The mosquito kills 750,000 people per year. That's like three quarters of a million. A word of caution in interpreting this data, of course, is needed. There are far more dogs in contact with humans. And this is probably why the number is so much higher. Right. So to know whether dogs are actually more dangerous, more dangerous than sharks, one should use a base rate of how many dogs we have per human. But we will actually we will actually see this later on when we talk about statistics, which will be in a few nights from now. So we said the frequent or dramatic events are more available in our mind, but so are very recent ones because the memory is still fresh. So we think of something as more likely. After a natural disaster, for example, insurance companies have to spend millions on payouts to cover for the damage. And yet they end up making more money when a disaster happens because many more people buy insurance all of a sudden. If a earthquake has just happened, people tend to think that another one is now more likely, given that a fresh memory comes more, comes more easily to mind. Mm, similarly, after a shark attack, the news of this shark attack spread and people become more scared of going in the water, which actually saves lives. It saves the lives of the people who would go in the water and drown from the riptide. So on average, 10 people are spared from drowning every time there is a shark attack. So now it makes sense what I said at the beginning, I hope. So there you go, shark attacks save lives. Due to a similar effect, when a plane, when a plane hijacking is reported, and luckily, this don't happen anymore. It's a thing of the past. But 
when it does happen, more people end up dying in car crashes in the aftermath of their hijacking because they choose to drive and not to fly because they're scared of flying when flying is actually the safer option. There are innumerable examples of how we judge the probability of something based on how easily we can list instances of that class. For example, we think that mental health and mental health issues such as depression and anxiety are an affliction of the 21st century in particular, of modern times, and that in the good old days, people were not depressed and our society is now in decline. But the truth is that mental health is now discussed way more than in the past. And so paradoxically, we think of depression as more frequent. 100 years ago, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health, which is where all the mental health um, disorders are listed, 100 years ago, it only listed 15 disorders. And now it lists about 300. So a lot more. They didn't just come out of the woodwork. They were always there, but there wasn't a name for them. Now, we can more easily list mental disorders at the present time. So we think that they are more frequent. Before, if you were depressed, there wasn't even a war to describe that. So, far from being in decline, our society now cares a lot more and people are better off because of it. The final thing I want to emphasize about the availability heuristic is that, in a paradoxical way, the ease with which we can list items is more influential than the actual number of items we list. This is an old experiment, and uh, in this old experiment, a professor asked his students to list possible improvements for his course. And afterwards, he asked them to rate the course. Some students were asked to list two improvements, and some students had to list six. And then they all rated the course. Paradoxically, people who had to list six improvements found it more difficult to come up with examples because they had to think about six of them. So they judged the course less harshly because they thought it's difficult to criticize it. People who had to list only two improvements could easily come up with the two examples because it's easy to find two examples. And so they, they had the impression that the course was rubbish, not that good. Because the two examples were easy to think, think of, easier than thinking about six, that's why they thought the course was not that good. Right? So, in summary, when we think by availability, we think of something to be frequent based on the subconscious ease with which we can retrieve examples from memory. This is very useful in many situations and it has evolved when we lived in a simpler society. But now, nowadays, it can lead us to error and bias when we apply it to the vast amount of information that we need to process. It is difficult and almost impos impossible to control uh, the availability bias, but certainly being mindful of it will help us being more critical and question our own opinions, understand our fears, and perhaps, perhaps it will make us less susceptible to the news and the movies that we watch, and in fact, more interested in the actual facts. I think that enough has been said tonight, and I will leave you alone to digest it all. There will be more like this in the next episode, where I will be talk talking about how our emotions affect our thinking. So for now, thank you and bye.